Hello class, we are now in the second half of the chapter on the central nervous system, which we will divide into two parts. The myelinating diseases of the central nervous system are acquired conditions characterized by preferential damage to myelin with relative preservation of axons. The clinical deficits, at least initially, are due to the effects of myelin loss on the transmission of electrical impulses along the axons. The natural history of demyelinating diseases is determined in part by the limited capacity of the CNS to regenerate normal myelin and by the degree of secondary damage to axons that occur as the disease runs its course. There are several pathologic processes that can cause loss of myelin, and this includes the immune-mediated destruction of myelin, which is uh, your multiple sclerosis, and also infection, as in progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy and your GC virus infection of oligodendrocytes. As mentioned, one of the demyelinating disorder is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune demyelinating disorder that is characterized by distinct episodes of neurologic deficits that are separated in time and are attributable to patchy white matter lesions that are separated in space. It is the most common of the demyelinating disorders and the disease may become clinically apparent at any age although onset in childhood or after 50 years of age is relatively rare. Women are affected twice as often as are men. In most individuals with multiple sclerosis, the clinical course takes the form of relapsing and remitting episodes of variable duration, maybe weeks, months, or years, that is marked by neurologic defects followed by gradual and partial recovery of neurologic function. This is very characteristic of multiple sclerosis, wherein patients would have episodes of neurologic defect, then this will be followed by remissions wherein patient will have partial recovery of neurologic function, which after a period of time, patient will again have episodes of neurologic deficits and this would go on and on, but the frequency of relapses tend to decrease over time. But there is a steady neurologic deterioration in most affected individuals. Multiple sclerosis is caused by an autoimmune response directed against components of the myelin sheath. As in other autoimmune disorders, the pathogenesis of this disease involves both genetic and environmental factors. The incidence of uh, multiple sclerosis is 15-fold higher when the disease is present in a first-degree relative and roughly 150 times higher with an affected monozygote twin. Despite a series of well-powered studies, only a portion of the genetic basis of the disease has been explained. It was found that there is a strong association between multiple sclerosis and the DR haplotype of the major histocompatibility complex, wherein each copy of the DRB1 1501 allele an individual inherits bring it with it a roughly three times increase in the risk of multiple sclerosis. 
Also associated with multiple sclerosis are the interleukin-2 and the interleukin-7 receptor genes. Now, the available evidence of the immune mechanism that underlie the destruction of myelin in multiple sclerosis indicates that the disease is initiated by the T helper 1 and the T helper 17 T cells that react against myelin antigens and secrete cytokines. Your Th1 uh, cells secretes interferon gamma, which activates your macrophages, while your Th17 cells promote the recruitment of leukocytes and the demyelination is caused by the activated leukocytes and their injurious products. Multiple sclerosis is a white matter disease that is best appreciated in sections of the brain and the spinal cord. In the fresh state, the lesions are firmer than the surrounding white matter, so there is sclerosis. And they appear as well-circumscribed, somewhat depressed, glassy, gray tan, irregularly shaped plaques as pointed by the arrows. The area of demyelination often has sharply defined borders a feature that is best appreciated with stains for myelin, which is your luxulfast blue stain. The size of the lesions varies considerably from small foci that are only recognizable microscopically to large confluent plaques, and the plaques commonly occur adjacent to the lateral ventricles as again pointed by the arrows. These plaques can also involve other sites where myelinated fibers are present, like the corpus callosum, the optic nerves and chiasm, brain stem, ascending and descending fiber tracts, cerebellum, and spinal cord. They can also extend into the gray matter. Microscopically, in active plaques, there is ongoing myelin breakdown associated with abundant foamy macrophages containing lipid-rich PAS-positive debris, and this is shown in the picture of the upper portion. And at the edge of the lesion, lymphocytes and monocytes are also present, mostly as perivascular cuff. Okay, so uh, that is marked by the red pen. And these active lesions are often centered on small veins. Okay. Myelin is usually completely absent, but the axons are relatively preserved. Now in time, these astrocytes would undergo reactive changes. As lesions become quiescent, the inflammatory cells slowly disappear. Within inactive plaques, there is no macrophage-rich infiltrate, little to no myelin is found, and there is a reduction in the number of oligodendrocyte nuclei. Instead, reactive gliosis is prominent or there is astrocytic proliferation. Now, shadow plaques are border between the normal and the affected white matter, and it is usually not well circumscribed. Although multiple sclerosis lesions can occur anywhere in the central nervous system, and consequently may induce a wide range of clinical manifestations, certain patterns of neurologic symptoms and signs are more common. 
we will have unilateral visual impairment due to the involvement of the optic nerve or what you will call the optic neuritis is a frequent initial manifestation of multiple sclerosis only 10 to 50 percent of affected individuals with, with optic neuritis go on to develop multiple sclerosis involvement of the brain stem would produce cranial nerve signs like ataxia nystagmus and internuclear ophthalmoplegia spinal cord lesions can give rise to motor and sensory impairment of trunk and limbs spasticity and loss of bladder control examination of the cerebrospinal fluid of individuals with multiple sclerosis would show a mildly elevated protein level and in one-third of cases there would be moderate pleiocytosis or an increased cell count of more than five leukocytes per microliter of CSF the IgG levels in the CSF are increased and uh, oligoclonal IgG bands are usually observed on immunoelectrophoresis. Treatment of multiple scler uh, sclerosis consists of several types of immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory agents, which may slow down the progression of the disease, but they are not curative. Now let's go to the neurodegenerative diseases. Neurodegenerative diseases are disorders characterized by the progressive loss of particular groups of neurons which often have shared function. So the disorder is selective. So they typically affect groups of neurons with functional relationships even they are not immediately adjacent. The pathologic process that is common across most of the neurodegenerative diseases is the accumulation of protein aggregates. Protein aggregates may arise because of mutations that alter the affected protein's conformation or disrupt the pathway that are involved in the processing or clearance of an otherwise normal protein. Regardless of how they arise, the protein aggregates typically are resistant to degradation and show aberrant localization within the neurons. The current evidence suggests that large or the microscopically visible protein aggregates are not toxic to the cells. Their formation appears to be an adaptive response that enables the cell to sequester small aggregates of the same protein which are directly toxic to the neurons. In other words, your large or microscopically visible protein aggregates are not toxic to the cells, but the smaller aggregates or the sequestered smaller aggregates are the ones that are directly toxic to the neurons. Other recent evidence suggests that protein aggregates are capable of behaving like prions. That is, aggregates derived from one cell may be taken up by another and provoke additional protein aggregation and there is no evidence that the neurodegenerative diseases are transmissible. The protein aggregates are recognized histologically as inclusion, which would serve as diagnostic hallmarks. Now this table will show the features of the major neurologic diseases. So I want you to take note particularly of the clinical pattern and the inclusions of the different diseases.
let's go through some of the neurodegenerative diseases. I will not include Prion's disease and your Kreutzfeldt Jacobs disease in this presentation, but you still have to read about these diseases in your textbook. We will just proceed with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia or decline in mental ability in older adults. Alzheimer's disease usually becomes clinically apparent as insidious or seemingly harmless impairment of higher cognitive or uh, intellectual functions. As the disease progresses, deficits in memory, uh, visual, spatial orientation, judgment, personality, and language would gradually emerge. And over a course of five to 10 years, the affected individual becomes profoundly disabled, mute, and immobile. Patients rarely become symptomatic before 50 years of age, and the incidence of the disease increases with age. Although pathologic examination of brain tissue obtained at autopsy remains necessary for definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, the combination of clinical assessment and current radiologic methods allow accurate pre-mortem diagnosis or before-death diagnosis in 80 to 90 percent of cases. The fundamental abnormality in Alzheimer's disease is the accumulation of two proteins, particularly your A-beta and your tau, in specific regions of the brain, and this is likely as a result of uh, excessive production and defective removal. The two pathologic hallmarks of uh, Alzheimer's disease particularly evident in the end stages of the illness are your amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillar tangles. The Amyloid plaques, or also known as the neuritic plaque or senile plaques, are deposits of aggregated A-beta peptides in the neurophil, while the neurofibrillary tangles are aggregates of the microtubule binding protein tau, which develop intracellularly and then persist extracellularly after neuronal death. The pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease thus involves your A-beta, tau, and several other genetic and host factors. The amyloid precursor protein is a cell surface protein with a single transmembrane domain that may function as a receptor possibly for prion proteins among other ligands. The A-beta portion of the protein extends from the extracellular region into the transmembrane domain. Processing of amyloid precursor protein begins with cleavage in the extracellular domain and is followed by an intramembranous cleavage. There are two potential extracellular sites of cleavage, which may be carried out by two different classes of proteases, which are your alpha secretase and your beta secretase. If the first cut occurs at the alpha secretase site, then your A beta is not generated, and this is the non-amyloidogenic pathway. Now, the, the other potential pathway is when the surface amyloid precursor protein may also be endocytosed into vesicles where it can be cleaved by the beta-secretase 
which cut at a slightly more N-terminal site or region of the A-beta sequence within the amyloid precursor protein. And this is the amyloidogenic pathway. Now, following cleavage of the amyloid uh, precursor protein at either of this site, the gamma secretase complex would perform an intramembranous cleavage. In the non-amyloidogenic pathway, it produces a soluble fragment. While in the amyloidogenic pathway, it generates the A-beta, which is prone to aggregation first into small oligomers, which may be the toxic form that is responsible for the neuronal dysfunction, eventually into large aggregates and fibrils and eventually to plaques. Now, the gross morphology of Alzheimer's disease is the brain will show variable degree of cortical atrophy. So you can see in the illustration on the top part, uh, you can see the difference of a healthy brain and a patient with advanced Alzheimer wherein you see the uh, cortical atrophy. So it is marked by widening of the cerebral sulci and this is most pronounced in the frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes. Now, the major microscopic abnormalities of Alzheimer's disease are neuritic or your senile plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles. The neuritic plaques are focal spherical collections of dilated tortus axonal or dendritic processes or your what you call the dystrophic neurites, often around a central amyloid core which may be surrounded by a clear halo. So that is your uh, neuritic plaques. Okay? The amyloid core, which can be stained by Congo red or a beta amyloid immunostain, contains several abnormal protein, and the dominant component of the amyloid plaque core is your A beta. Now, also present at the periphery of neuritic plaques would be the microglial cells and the reactive astrocytes. Uh, these neuritic plaques are found in the hippocampus, amygdala, and the neocortex, although there is usually relative sparing of the primary motor and sensory cortices. Now, uh, this relatively sparing uh, this relative sparing of primary motor and sensory cortices are both applicable for the neuritic plaques and uh, neuro, uh, neurofibrillary tangles. Now, the neurofibrillary tangles are tau-containing bundles of filaments in the cytoplasm of the neurons that displace or encircle the nucleus. In pyramidal neurons, they often have an elongated flame shape, while in rounder cells, the basket weave of fibers around the nucleus takes on a rounded contour or what you call the globus tangles. Now, the neurofibrillary tangles are visible as basophilic fibrillary structures with uh, using the hematoxylin and eosin stain but are demonstrated much more clearly if you use the silver or the Belchowski staining. In contrast to neuritic and diffuse plaques, tangles are found in other neurodegenerative diseases and are thus not specific for Alzheimer's disease. In addition to the diagnostic features of plaques and tangles, 
There are several other pathologic findings seen in the setting of Alzheimer's disease. Like your cerebral amyloid angiopathy is almost invariable accompaniment of Alzheimer's disease. However, your cerebral amyloid angiopathy can also be found in brains of individuals without Alzheimer's disease. Now, in contrast also, the amyloid deposits in uretic and diffuse plaques, which mainly consist of a beta 42, the amyloid in your cerebral amyloid angiopathy is predominantly comprised of a beta 40. Now, in addition, uh, I mean, in the older edition, like the 8th edition, it was mentioned that the granulovacular degeneration and hirano uh, bodies are also pathologic findings in Alzheimer's disease. Now, clinically, the, uh, the progression of Alzheimer's disease is slow but relentless with a symptomatic course often running more than 10 years and the initial symptoms are forgetfulness and other memory disturbances. With progression, other symptoms would emerge including uh, language deficits, loss of mathematical skills, uh, and loss of learned motor skills. Then in the final stages, the affected individual may become incontinent, uh, mute, and unable to walk. Now, intercurrent disease like uh, pneumonia is usually the terminal event or usually the cause of death of patients with Alzheimer's disease. Next would be Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disease marked by a hypokinetic movement disorder that is caused by loss of dopaminergic neurons from the substantia nigra. The clinical syndrome of Parkinsonism combines diminished facial expression, and this is often termed as mask fascist, then they ha uh, Parkinsonism also would uh, present with stooped posture, slowing of voluntary movement, festinating gait or what you call uh, the progressively shortened accelerated steps, and there would also be rigidity and a pin rolling tremor. This type of motor disturbance is seen in a number of conditions that are associated with damage to the nigrostriatal dopaminergic system. Now, here is an illustration of the clinical manifestations of patients with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so they would have a mask-like fascia, uh, stoop. Uh, posture, the hips and the knees are tightly flexed, okay, they would have a uh, festinating gait, okay. Now, the clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is based on the presence of the triad of Parkinsonism, okay, and this includes your tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesis, okay? But take note, the triad must present in the absence of a toxic or other known underlying etiology. This clinical impression is confirmed by symptomatic response to L-DOPA replacement therapy. Although the diagnosis of uh, Parkinson's disease is based in large part on the presence of the motor symptoms which reflect the decreased dopaminergic innervation of the striatum, 
the disease is not restricted to dopaminergic neurons or the basal ganglia. The severity of the motor syndrome is proportional to the dop dopamine deficiency which can at least in part be corrected by replacement therapy with your L-DOPA which is the immediate precursor of your dopamine. However, treatment does not reverse the structural changes or arrest the progression of the disease because with progression, the drug therapy becomes less effective and symptoms would be more difficult to manage. Parkinson's disease is associated with protein accumulation and aggregation, mitochondrial abnormalities, and neuronal loss in the substantia nigra and elsewhere in the brain. Most cases of Parkinson's disease is sporadic. The first mutation identified as a cause of autosomal dominant Parkinson's disease involved uh, the SNCA, which is a gene that encodes your alpha synuclein. This alpha synuclein is an abundant lipid binding protein normally localized to the synapses. And this is the major pro, uh, component of uh, Lewy body, which is the diagnostic hallmark of Parkinson's disease. So gross findings for Parkinson's disease would be pallor of substantia nigra and locus aureus, And this is due to the loss of pigmented catecholaminergic neurons. Microscopically, as mentioned, the diagnostic hallmark of Parkinson's disease are the Lewy bodies, which may be found in some of the remaining neurons. It would appear as single or multiple cytoplasmic eosinophilic round to elongated inclusions that are often um, having dense core surrounded by a pale halo. So this is how your Lewy body would look like. Now the next neurodegenerative disease that we would go through is the Huntington disease. Huntington disease is an autosomal dominant disease that is caused by the generation of the striatal neurons and characterized by progressive movement disorder and dementia. Jerky, hyperkinetic, sometimes dystonic movements involving all parts of the body or chorea are characteristic and the affected individuals may later develop radicinesia and rigidity. The disease is relentlessly progressive and uniformly fatal with an average course of about 15 years. Huntington disease is a prototypic polyglutamine trinucleotide repeat expansion disease. The gene for Huntington's disease is your HTT which is located on chromosome 4p16.3, which encodes a protein known as Huntington. Now, the pathologic hallmark of Huntington's disease is protein aggregation and development of intranuclear inclusions containing Huntington, and it is uncertain whether these processes are directly involved in cellular injury. The brain in Huntington's disease is small and shows striking atrophy of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. And the components of dorsum striatum, the globus pallidus, may also atrophy secondarily 
and the lateral and third ventricles are dilated. The atrophy is frequently seen also in the frontal lobe, less often in the parietal lobe, and occasionally through the entire cortex. On microscopic examination, there is profound loss of striatal neurons and the most marked changes are found in the caudate nucleus. Pathologic changes develop in a medial to lateral direction in the caudate and from dorsal to ventral in the putamen. Both large and small neurons are affected, but the small neurons generally occur first. The medium-sized spiny neurons uh, that use the gamma aminobutyric acid as their neurotransmitter along with the enkephalin, uh, dinorphine, and substance P are also specially affected, while those that are diaphorase-positive neurons and the large cholinesterase-positive neurons are spared. The clinical features in Huntington's disease is due to the loss of the medium spiny striatal neurons, which normally function to dampen the motor activity and because of the loss would result in the dysregulation and an increase in the motor output and would manifest as choreoathetosis. Now, the age of onset of Huntington's disease most commonly occur in the 4th and 5th decade and motor symptoms often precede the cognitive impairment. Uh, the movement disorder in Huntington's disease is choreiform wherein there is increased and involuntary jerky movement of all parts of the body and there is rhythmic movement of the extremity uh, which is typical. The early symptoms of higher cortical dysfunction would include forgetfulness and thought and uh, affective disorder. Then there would be progression uh, to severe dementia and they have increased risk of suicide. But the most common natural cause of death would be intercurrent infection. Then we have now the amyotropic lateral sclerosis. Your ALS is a progressive disorder in which there is loss of upper motor neurons in the cerebral cortex and lower motor neuron in the spinal cord and brainstem. The loss of these neurons would result in denervation of muscles producing weakness that becomes profound as the disease progresses. Uh, ALS uh, affects men slightly more frequent than women and commonly emerges in the fifth decades or later. The amyotropic lateral sclerosis is both sporadic and familial, although the sporadic ALS is more common than familial, and they are associated with the generation of uh, upper and lower motor neurons, often in association with toxic protein accumulation. The associated uh, mutations in ALS would include genes encoding the copper zinc superoxide dismutase or the SOD1 on chromosome 21. Morphologically, the anterior roots of the spinal cord are thin due to the loss of lower motor neuron axons and the precentral motor gyrus in the cortex may be atrophic in especially severe cases. There is reduction in the number of anterior horn neurons throughout the length of the spinal cord associated with a reactive gliosis. The remaining neurons often contain PAS-positive cytoplasmic inclusions, and this is what you call your bonina bodies.
Now, early symptoms of ALS includes asymmetric weakness of the hands manifested by dropping of objects and difficulty performing fine motor tasks. There will also be cramping and spasticity of the arms and legs. And as the disease progresses, muscle strength and bulk diminish and involuntary contractions of individual motor neurons term fasciculations will also occur. The disease eventually involves the respiratory muscles leading to recurrent bouts of pneumonia. Although most affected individuals have a combination of upper and lower motor neuron involvement, other patterns may be observed. The term progressive muscular atrophy applies to uncommon cases in which the lower motor neuron involvement predominates. While the primary lateral sclerosis refers to cases with mostly upper motor neuron involvement. Now in some individuals or in some affected individuals, the generation of the lower brainstem cranial motor nuclei occur early and progresses rapidly. And this pattern is referred to as the progressive vulva, vulvar palsy or the vulvar ALS. In these individuals, abnormalities of swallowing and speech would dominate. And the clinical course is uh, unstoppable during the first or two years period. When bulbar involvement is less severe, about half of affected individuals are alive two years after diagnosis. Now the motor neuron uh, innervating the extraocular muscles are among the last to be involved in ALS. Now, familial cases develop symptoms earlier than the sporadic cases, but the clinical course is comparable. So that was the last slide for the first part of the second half of the chapter. So we will continue with the last part of the chapter on uh, the next time we meet. Okay, thank you. Have a good day.